Hey, good morning, everyone. Uh, let's pray. Heavenly Father, bless the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts, and may they be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I hope all of you had a Merry Christmas and uh, and uh, a blessed a blessed New Year. Um, it is Thursday evening, and uh, yeah, I, I, I don't know if you can see it in this darkness, but I've got my uh, suit coat on and I'm about to go out because uh, today is Kimberly's and my anniversary, New Year's Day. I always joke about the fact we did that because I'd remember it. Um, <laughs> but we're going to go out in a little bit and, and, and do some celebrating. Um, but at any rate, I'm coming to you, uh, virtually, even you who are at the legacy center, because tomorrow, Friday, Kimberly and I, and Adrian and Stephanie are going to be shooting up North into the UP to go see Kimberly's mom, who is in a hospice situation. And she's declining relatively uh, fast. And so just want to try to get there, spend a day or two with her uh, in her last days. So please pray for our safe travel and, and pray for our time with Dean. And, um, and yeah, let's get to our message. So today we talk about the wise men, the magi, how are the we three kings of Orient are. Um, I mean, if you read the text, we don't know that it's three, but we always say three because there were three gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. But the title of this message is Find Jesus. And some of you might say, wait a minute. Didn't Pastor Tom say Find Jesus last Sunday? Yes. Yes. And I wished that like I could tell you because Tom is so brilliant. He thought I'm going to throw this in on Christmas Eve or the Sunday after Christmas Eve just because I know that I'm going to use it the next week. Uh, I'm not that bright, but the Holy Spirit is. And let me get to my point. This last Sunday when Nicodemus took that baby Jesus in his hands and said, Lord, now let me depart in peace for my eyes have seen my salvation which you have prepared, I can go and I can leave in peace now because my eyes have seen the salvation that you've prepared for me. And I talked about the fact that peace, peace seems to be a wandering thing, tough to find, tough to hold on to. And the moment we think we've got it, boy, like the world just pulls the rug out from under our feet. And what I said was, what you got to do is find Jesus. So those, you remember that? You got to find Jesus. We learned that we learned that with the disciples that everything seems to be better for them when they're around Jesus. But when they're not around Jesus, they can get themselves into some trouble. They can get themselves into some silly behaviors and thinking. But when they're around Jesus, things start to right. We talked about the fact that on that on that boat in the middle of that storm, Jesus is asleep and they're all bailing like he's not even there. They're all, oh my gosh, we're going to die. We're going to die. Until finally one of them wakes up and says, Jesus, hey, don't you care that we're going to die? And I think Jesus says to them, you of little faith. What he means is, why didn't you just wake me up and ask me to do what I would do for you? Don't you yet know who I am? I'm Jesus. I'm the son of God. And he says to the winds and the waves, be still. And they're still. I want to take that thought and take it into our lives and say it's always about finding Jesus. So here you have these, these wise men, these magi. Who are they? Well, they're from the east, which means they're from Persia. They're, so, so, so let's build some history. Why would they come to see Jesus, and why would they even know about Jesus? Why would they even care? I mean, like, let's explain it. If you recall, back when we were studying Jeremiah and Habakkuk and, 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 and those books of the Old Testament, we were talking about a time in Israel's history when God was going to come down and destroy Jerusalem and destroy Israel and Judah by Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon. 
and he was going to take them captives for 70 years. Well, he did take the nation, and they were captive for 70 years. But somewhere in that 70 years, the Persians beat the Babylonians, and the Persians took over. And the Persians were the ones, if you recall, uh, where Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that, that they are serving the king. And it is believed that these faithful Jews who were dispersed into Persia, many of them came back when God granted grace upon the Persian king and directed him to send uh, uh, them back and rebuild Jerusalem and, and, and rebuild the nation of Israel, that many Jews stayed in the area. But what, what really stayed in the area was the word of God. And so the, the wise people, the astrologers, the people who studied the world and studied life and studied everything and wanted to answer the questions of why and who we are, these are the Magi. They would have been scholarly. And the, it's, the idea is they probably had some of the Jewish scriptures in their libraries. And one of the things that they knew because the Jews lived among them was that they were hoping for a savior. And as they're reading texts about, about the the star and, 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 and how God might reveal himself. And all of a sudden they see this star and it's a star that's never been in the sky before. And so they start to follow. They just know they got to go find the savior. They don't know it's Jesus. They don't know that's his name, but they got to find him. So I want you to realize that there's Jews in Bethlehem, there's Jews in Jerusalem, and they don't even see the star. The spiritual darkness over the nation of Israel, they can't even see the star. But here you have these magi traveling for two years to come see Jesus. So this is, for those of you who know, this is where I tease everybody that when I come to your house around Christmas time, I'm going to move the wise men away from the manger and put them over on your piano or on some table over there because they're not at the manger. Jesus is around two years old. It takes them two years to travel. And all they do is every day wake up and keep following the star and following the star. Because they need to see Jesus. They need to find this Savior. They need to find this one. Because they knew this was an act of God. They knew God was doing something. And it was important for them to find him. Man, does that not shout out to this world today and shout out to 2020 that you need Jesus? To anybody who doesn't believe in Jesus today, I would say to you, what has 2020 taught you except there is no one else to believe in? Everybody's deceiving somebody. Everybody's lying. You can't trust politicians. You can't trust businessmen. You can't trust owners of social media. You can't trust anybody. You got to find Jesus because somewhere when you find him, you find truth. And when you find truth, everything starts to get righted. So imagine, imagine that these guys travel for two years and they finally get to this massive city, Jerusalem. All the history about Jerusalem and they arrive. But as soon as they get to Jerusalem, they can't see the star anymore. And the reason why they end up in Jerusalem is two reasons. One is Bethlehem is really close to Jerusalem so that they would have gone to the largest city in that direction. And then where do you go when you can't see the star and you, and you want to find a king? You go to a king's palace. But you see in those days... It's not the Babylonians or the Persians that are controlling Jerusalem and Israel. It is the Romans. Brothers and sisters in Christ, 
I need you to realize that you cannot find freedom or peace in the kingdom of this world. What you will find are Romans, Persians, Babylonians. You will constantly find somebody that wants to enslave you into their ideas, into their way of life. The one with the most money and the one with the most power, power has the most influence. It's one big game, a king of the hill. And guarantee you, you and I aren't anywhere near the top of that hill. So they go to Herod's palace and they say, where is he who's called the king of the Jews? And he going, what are you talking about, man? I'm the king of the Jews. Because see, Herod gave himself that title. But the problem is, Herod hadn't given birth to a son. So now Herod's wondering what in the world's going on when he finds out that these people have traveled for two years. These important men. These were not just ordinary men. These were not shepherds. These were influential men who traveled two years to find the one who was born, the king of the Jews, the one who was promised to be the Messiah. We got to find him. And Herod's going, you're not here. And so then Herod calls in some religious leaders and says, hey, 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 you guys, you talk about a savior that's going to be born, a messiah. Where is he going to be born? Where do your scriptures say he was going to be born? In Bethlehem, in Judea. And they quote the verse. Herod tells the Magi, the wise men, to go to, to go to Bethlehem. And after they go there, and after they find the child, come back and tell me where that child is so that I might go to him. And here we find two different ways to find Jesus. I know I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit, but the wise men go to worship him like you and I are worshiping him today. They go to give him gifts that are due his honor as we give of our offerings and the blessings, give back some of the blessings that he gives to us. They're acting in faith. Herod, he wants to find Jesus so that he might kill him. Jesus isn't two years old and already somebody wants him dead. And we know this because we know at the end of the story that the angel of God comes and talks to the magi, the wise men, and tells them not to go back to Herod, but to go back another way. And when Herod hears about it, he doesn't know what to do because he doesn't know where the child is. So he kills every male child two years old or younger in the whole area of Bethlehem. And by that, he, he fulfills another verse of scripture where Rachel is weeping for the loss of her children. But Jesus isn't swept up in that act of hatred and violence because an angel warns Joseph to take Mary and the baby to Egypt, which is a fulfillment of another Old Testament passage. I mean, the number God is controlling history and making scripture passages be fulfilled even when Jesus is a baby being born, even when Jesus is two years old and he's not can't even control his own destiny God is making it all happen. But the wonder of all of this is utterly amazing to me. But I want you to realize that there is always these two kingdoms, and they're at war. See, the kingdom of this world knows that this Savior is, this savior is not just a Savior. He is God's weapon. He is God's Joshua. He is going to come and crush the devil's head. He is going to kill <clears throat> the powers 
of the kingdom of this world. He is going to set us free from captivity to the slave, the enslavement of sin and this world and make us born again into a new kingdom. He's going to give us the abundant life and the eternal life that he has always wanted for Adam and Eve and wants for us. It's all going to happen. And so the kingdom of this world is going to satanically use individuals like Herod or the religious leaders throughout Jesus's life to try to snuff him out. So there's always going to be those people who want to find Jesus for the wrong reason. But today, may we be the wise men. The Bible tells us that, that they walk out of one of the gates of Jerusalem. And the Bible says they looked up and lo, the star. Interesting. They lost sight of the star coming into Jerusalem, but walking out of Jerusalem, now they can see it again. To me, that's a picture of spiritual darkness over the city. They're so excited. The Greek has adjectives tumbling all over themselves as they're overflowing. I mean, for two years you've been traveling, and now the star's gone, but now it finally reappears. I mean, imagine the, the joy that they have as finally they're seeing that star again and they follow the star and they get to this house. And when they get to this house, they find this mom and this dad and this two-year-old boy. And they learn that his name is Jesus. And unlike Herod, they bow down and they worship him. Not even the not, not, not even the shepherds did that. These men who are not Jewish, these men who knew that they, they were impacted by the truths of the scriptures of God and felt like scripture was being fulfilled, that the God of the universe was fulfilling something, they travel for two years and they finally get to see this child and they fall down and worship a two-year-old. What does that worship look like? Is worship going to church? No. But you can worship going to church. Worship starts from the inside out as the spirit within us starts to hum because it is near the spirit of God. It is like it is like John the Baptist leaping in the womb because Mary, who has conceived Jesus, and John the Baptist are in the same room, and John the Baptist leaps inside the womb. Worship. It's what godly people do. It's what believers do when they're in the presence of Almighty God. They bow down and worship Him, and they give Him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Expensive stuff, probably stuff that Joseph and Mary were able to use when they traveled to Egypt and traveled back and needed to get a new home in, in Nazareth. But you may or may not know that each of those gifts has an interesting message about Jesus. See, gold... Gold is something that you would give a king. Frankincense was one of the most powerful ointments and oils that priests and religious people would use. Myrrh was expensive, but it was used in burial. It was used in the embalming of a body. Jesus is going to be a prophet, priest, and king. He is going to be a king who's also a priest, who is also the very lamb who's going to be sacrificed the sins of the world. I just marvel at God putting all this together. To all these people, they're just living out their lives and doing their thing. What God is doing is fulfilling his purpose and promise. We need to see that. Moving from 2020 to 2021, I cannot guarantee you that 2020 
in the kingdom of this world's perspective is going to have any more order or less chaos than 2020. I pray it does, but I can't guarantee it. What I can guarantee you is every single day, if you get up and find Jesus, you'll feel more peaceful. If you find Jesus, you'll feel righter. If you find Jesus and bow down and worship him, you'll find a rightness that can get you through any trial or tribulation. So, yeah, I never thought that I would preach this message with a, with a title, Find Jesus. But I don't think there's ever been a year that I've been alive that it's more apropos. I pray that today you have found him anew. And that while you have found him, he has recaptured your heart and your imagination like he has mine. And that although you're moving into a 2021 that is uncertain, it is not uncertain to him because he's the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. So every single day, every single day in 2021, find him. If that means doing devotions with us in the morning, if that means doing the version devotions with us or the video devotions with Kimberly and I, find him. Not us, the Jesus we talk about. We're wanting to do the same thing when we do them. We're finding him when we prepare for those devotions. We're finding him. And as we do that together, we like these, these wise men, no matter what the day is like, we find him. And know that you will always find him at the cross. You will always find him at an empty tomb. And you will always find him in the spirit of God that dwells within you. So you don't have to look far. Just look up and look within. Amen.